All right, so I have a special treat for you. I said I'd go ahead and go over this pickup truck here, um, and I'm gonna go ahead and hold up to that promise. Um, this here is uh, Robert and Kimber's 1977 uh, Ford F-250. This is an early 77 high boy. Um, if you don't know what the high boy is, you can go ahead and look that up. It's an enthusiast term. It was never a term put out there by Ford. I will just touch on that. Um, but if you wanna know the difference between a high boy and a standard pickup truck, uh, of later years for the F-250, you can go ahead and look that up. That's common knowledge. Anyhow, um, so this is their 77 uh, High Boy. Uh, this pickup truck uh, does not have the right grills in it, but it was uh, um, obtained by Robert to go ahead and build for Kimber to use because it was an automatic truck. Um, they had seen it while driving through Oregon, I want to say towards Medford. I don't recall correct or exactly where, but anyways, um, and Robert had called me up and asked me if this was a viable truck for the price. He told me the price, which I forget what it was at this point. But, uh, and I said, yeah, if you want to go ahead and tackle that as a small project, uh, yeah, that could be done. I mean, it's a fair price. And so he went ahead and picked it up and drove it down from Oregon, and we started right to work on it. I think we did one camping trip before that, though. Um, the truck was mostly stock when we started. Um, this is now up on a six-inch lift from Skyjacker. Uh, it was not like this when we got it. It did have aftermarket aluminum wheels on it, but it was fairly stock. Um, the pickup truck is kind of a conglomeration of a few different parts of pickup trucks. Most of the body, from what I can tell, is original. But um, there was like the grill, and the grill shell was not out of this pickup truck. Actually, the original grill shell was shoved in the back. Somebody had put a billet grill in this um, and kind of cut the plastics to kind of make it work. They also had some black plastics that were the same year like this, the 73 through 70, uh, 75. Um, wasn't very impressed with them. We never did find any 76 and up grills to go ahead and stick in here, so we never wound up putting them in, and it kind of looks good this way. Um, so pretty well this truck was painted just like this. She's a little dull right now because she's been sitting. She doesn't get driven or polished down a lot. I think the last time this was polished was about four years ago. So she needs to be kind of cleaned up a little bit. Um, again, like I said, she's on a six inch lift. Uh, this is obviously the four by four being the high boy. Um, we have uh, some 35s here, Goodyear Wrangler MTR Kevlars. Uh, these are the same type that I run on my 74 bodied 1979 F-150. Uh, we have some Black Rock custom wheels here. These are the same as the Bronco, along with the tire, both E-rated and the same wheel. So that way they could be interchangeable between both eight lug trucks. Uh, the other thing that these match are uh, Robert and Kimber's camping trailer, or what I call mine, the trail trailer. Um, so these uh, tires and wheels can be interchanged between the uh, camper trailer and it can be interchanged between the Bronco and this pickup truck. So you have two spares that will work on almost any truck or you can pull one or the other off if you wind up in a problem in the trail and you need to take one back to go ahead and save your rump. Um, really good idea. We have these wheels custom made by Black Rock. Um, Black Rock was uh, willing to do a reverse drop center so that way we could go ahead and pull this wheel out and get enough offset to the rear uh, or actually kind of more to the front so we could space out the rear uh, to go ahead and clear the leaf springs not only on this truck but also the radius arms on the Bronco. Um, we ran into problems like that with my wheels that I have from Black Rock that were custom built that uh, I kind of rub my radius arms if I'm all the way to lock so eventually I will have to replace those. Um, Robert went with the round cut wheel because uh, the insides of these being round, they can hold a little bit extra load and Black Rock was willing to do the offset on this wheel and not for the D style. Um, honestly, I think they look fine. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the style. I do like the D window, but these look really well or really good. Um, anyhow, um, again, the lift kit is a full spring kit from Skyjacker. Uh, we have the Rancho shocks on it, not the Skyjacker shocks. Uh, it does uh, utilize the original uh, rear block, um, which is fine because that's the original rear block, so it's not going to have any more wheel hop than it would have from uh, factory. These do flex fairly well. We've had it off-road a few times. Um, this has the factory power steering in it, which is the Ram Assist. Kind of causes a little bit of like a bump steer feeling if you've never driven one before. I'm not a huge fan of them, but they do work. Um, a lot of the original units are kind of 
beyond repair and they leak and have a lot of other issues. Uh, this one here, uh, the RAM and the control unit were re rebuilt for us by uh, uh, Redhead, or, yeah, Redhead Steering Gear out of Washington. Uh, really good system. The steering box is also a Redhead. Uh, this is still the stock push-pull steering. We decided to do that instead of converting this to a 77 and a half and over steering and cutting into the chassis. We didn't do it, want to do a bunch of cutting with the chassis. Um, this truck came to us with a 429 in it out of an LTD or I think a Thunderbird. Uh, kind of more suited for a car engine. Somebody put a set of Dove heads on them, D0VEs. Um, it had a lot of issues. We tried to get this thing to work and it kept on having problems with pre-detonation. So we we're getting a lot of knocking. At one point I had to tune back the uh, distributor back to about I think two degrees base timing. Um, not really good. You should be having more advance than that, especially out of a stock motocraft distributor. We wound up putting the MSD in it. It only got worse from there. I never managed to get it to tune. At one point, I did manage to get it to stop knocking when I started pouring 110 octane leaded into this sucker. Uh, fueling this thing with 110 octane, ah, it's probably not a good idea. It did stop the knocking, but... Yeah, though it smells like candy bars coming out of the exhaust, it wasn't it wasn't viable. So uh, we took this motor out and we took it to uh, our guy Steve at Valley Balance and Machine in Ceres, California. He went through the motor and asked what he what he wanted to do with it, and Robert said pretty much I want to be able to haul a fully loaded heavy trailer in the back that's about the equivalent of another pickup behind it or a heavy RV and be able to go straight up a grade, anything in Highway 80, Highway 50, 88 and not have this thing bogged down on me. So uh, he went ahead and uh, uh, Steve built us a 460, uh, so it was better suited. You have a little bit uh, little bit more cubic inches to go ahead and bump out behind this thing, and if you're gonna run a 485 series, that's the way to go. Um, he built us the 460 for it. Uh, in the meantime, we got the l, &L conversion kit for the engine and went ahead and uh, did all the L, &L pulleys and uh, mounts and the exhaust, they're shorty headers. Um, after we got the motor back, we went ahead and we put it in the truck, uh, went ahead and tuned up the MSD dist or distributor that's in here and changed the curve. I think it's running a single heavy, uh, I know it's got the single heavy silver spring on it. I can't remember if we used a lightweight blue or silver spring. I wanna say it was the silver spring if I recall correctly. Um, so I think it's both silver, silver springs, light and heavy. Um, we have it at about uh, 8 to 10 base timing. I forget where we ended at. I think 8 wound up being the magic number, um, which worked really well with the curve. Um, so you don't want to really exceed 31 to 32 degrees of timing at top end. You have to limit it. So I think this is running the blue bushing in it to go ahead and achieve that and limit the timing curve. So this has a really snappy timing curve to it, and she gives her a lot of torque but uh, it doesn't exceed that uh, max timing spec. Um, uh, moving on, we still have uh, stock style steering in this. We didn't go anything heavy like the Clydesdale or do anything that was uh, uh, like a high steer system. We didn't see the need of it. I think these are all rebuilt Moogs. These were several years ago. I've heard that the Moog quality has gone down. I haven't experienced it yet. Um, I do have the Moog steering in my excursion. I have not had an issue with it as of yet. Um, moving on, we went ahead and upped the, uh, the uh, drive shaft diameter between the transmission and transfer case, this being a divorced unit, being a high boy. Um, we have the wall of the um, drive shaft that is between the two uh, is a little thicker. I do not recall the actual thickness, but it's fairly thick and fairly heavy. Uh, that's running a 1350U joint, which is way larger than what they had factory. Uh, if I remember right, I think they had a 1315 or a 1330 factory. I want to say it was a 1315. It was either that or the front shaft was a 1315. Um, having the larger U-joint, you can put a lot more torque and load on it, and you're not going to have as many problems with breaking the drive line. You break that center line, you ain't going anywhere. Um, so we figured that we'd make that the heaviest, so that way it's not a fuse. It's something that will stay going. Um, the fuse would be more of... Uh, the front and rear drive shaft. From what I remember, I think we're running a 1330 front and rear for the U-joint size. The shafts on these were built by uh, 
Steve over at Valley Balance and Machine yet again. Um, he did us really good on this. We dropped it off. Uh, he built us up the drive lines, picked her back up. Have not had a problem with it. We've beat, beat and wailed on this thing, spun the tires, even though Kimber kind of doesn't know about a little bit of that. Um, and we haven't seen any issues with it. Um, the rear axles, the Dana 60, that one there has the ARB carrier in it, but it still has the stock heavier spline axles, not 35 splines. We never did that on this truck after the nightmare that we had to deal with boring out the, uh, the uh, Broncos uh, uh, spindles to go ahead and fit those 35 splines that are meant more for like a Dana 70. I touch on that in some of the Bronco videos. Um, the front is still a stock Dana 44 HD. Um, we did change up the, uh, the locking hubs to be the worn premiums. We did change out the shafts and rebuild those. Uh, those are a chrome molly shaft. This is a chrome molly shaft, both front and rear. Um, the uh, front axle, if I recall correctly, is either the open or the limited slip axle that came in this, or I'm sorry, differential that came in this axle. Uh, we did not go ARB in the front. We skimped on that because the Bronco has front and rear ARB. That's more of an off-road vehicle. This is more a camping, hauling, driving rig. Kind of just for fun, you know, go on a fire trail or something. So it's overbuilt for that use. Um, again, like I said, the body has been left alone. The door was left off, I think mostly because of the Bondo marks that are right here and here. The paint didn't really adhere very well on the door. Um, We'll probably have that fixed later for Kimber, uh, especially if Adam's guy is willing to look at it. But for now, it's just left alone. Uh, it was, again, repainted by the previous owner that was in Oregon, so we don't know what all has been hidden underneath here. I went over with a magnet checker. I don't have too much Mondo. There's just a little bit here on the door. Um, other than that, Robert can't leave anything alone, so uh, we kept... Uh, we kept most of this truck original. The topper came with the pickup truck. It's a Stockland topper. Uh, that topper either came with this truck or I suspect it may have came off of a bump side truck. It's got kind of an odd little curve on the back end. I haven't seen on a Stockland topper for a dent side. I could be wrong. Stockland kind of made some custom stuff. There was different molds that were available and different models for these. Uh, Stockland was based out of Stockton, California for the longest time. He's been out of business for 20 plus years now. So finding a Stockland topper is kind of hard. Uh, some of these sold through dealerships out here in California, Oregon, Nevada. Uh, I think they made it out as far as Arizona and Washington. I'm not 100%. Perhaps they made it up to Idaho. I haven't completely confirmed that. Um, I have seen these toppers all over the West Coast and in the Pacific Northwest and you know, kind of just in the Northwest portion of the state or a uh, country. Um, we went ahead and uh, put the light bar on here. That's a car bar, C-A-R-R. -R. Um, I can put the details of that in the description later. Uh, we went ahead and put a uh, LED light bar on there because that was kind of the craze of the time and Robert wanted to have something a little bit more modern. Uh, we put the rigid lights in the corner uh, so that way we could go ahead and pull out lights. If you're out hunting or anything, you're in base camp or anything, or you want to drive down a trail and see to the side of you, you can go ahead and flash those suckers up. And I will tell you what, it is daylight when those things are on. Uh, to top that off, we also have LED headlights from uh, Delta Tech. Uh, they're, a, I think, an H11 style LED uh, replacement. Those are actually uh, sold uh, through a Mustang restorer. I think these were bought through Mustangs Plus. I don't recall. But if you look up a uh, headlight kit for a 67 to 68 Ford Mustang, they are the same headlight. They will fit. They will work. They've been great headlights. They're not the best headlight in the world. They're not a projector, but they kind of look factory while at the same time having an LED bulb, which does solve some of the brightness issues that Ford had because they undersized all the wiring for all these trucks. And the headlights were never that great when they were the sealed beams. Um, other than that, uh, the truck has pretty well been left alone. The truck came with two side saddle tanks in the back here. Uh, those were set up on a manual valve. That was from a company that was out of uh, Oregon. I forget the name. Uh, I don't think we have the plate anymore to be able to tell, but uh, that company is long gone and out of business. They don't have sending units in them, but we do have them now set up where they don't run the manual valve down by the seat anymore but they're running on twin valves that we set up to uh, go ahead and use with two switches that we put on the dash, which I'll show you later. Um, those two valves that we're running are actually for a 1979 Ford F-150 with dual tanks. 
Uh, the way that we set it up is that way you could go ahead and run both of the side saddle tanks without sending units, run them both out of fuel. When you run out of fuel, switch over to the following one. When both of those are out of fuel, we will swap uh, over to the gas tank that is in the cab, and that one there has a sending unit so you know when you're going to be out. Um, other than that, I built a custom rear winch bumper, which I'll be touching on in a minute. Uh, I based that one off of the worn winch bumper that I had uh, from Chief Blackhawk, my 74 body 1979. It is an original. I have the original literature even for it in sales brochure. Um, that bumper that I made uh, for this truck, I kind of braced a little bit more. I have uh, angle iron top and bottom, and then I have two plates going up the back that are sharing the bumper bolts on the bumper side of the truck. Uh, that has an 8,000 pound winch from Warren in it, and I went ahead and put the plug in the same location that you would have had for the original Warren bumper, and then we added a 7-pin uh, connector in here to cover up where the hole was for the 5-pin that was original. Um, boy, you know, other than that, I pretty much touched on most of this. I'll go ahead and do a walkthrough since most of everybody's attention span isn't really going to be this long, so if you've watched up to this point, thank you. Um, I'll go ahead and say now, just please like, subscribe, comment, tell me what you do and don't like about these videos. I know for sure people are going to say that they don't like the length of this. Uh, a lot of people now, short attention span, I'm even in that group. But um, thank you for making it to this point. Uh, the more subscribers that I can get, the more money that I can put towards uh, the Bronco when I get monetized. I need to get a thousand subscribers. I think I'm at like two something right now. Everybody that's subscribed up to this point, thank you, thank you, thank you. You're getting me that much closer that much closer to that goal. Um, so we'll go ahead and walk through this truck real fast and I'll just do a real basic walk through and we can be done with it. So uh, this is one of the hoods that opens up fairly easily. I'm thankful for that. I'm gonna go ahead and open her up. This is the 460. We have D3 VA or D3 VE heads on this. We got rid of the doves. Um, the doves uh, are kind of one of those things that just became one of those legendary things on forums and everybody goes, oh, I have to have the doves. I'm not a, I'm not a fan. They can be a good cylinder head, but you got to do a lot of work to do them. They're not just a slap and go kind of head. Uh, the D3VEs have done plenty enough for this thing. Um, we have a custom camshaft in here. I do not recall the specs. I will go ahead and put that camshaft details in there because I do have a photo of the original cam box uh, from when this was swapped over. Um, the camshaft was done, the heads were reworked a little bit, we have the Edelbrock Performer uh, intake on there, and then the 670 Holly, which is the Truck Avenger version. We did have to do a lot with this Holly to go ahead and retune it. Um, the uh, IFR bleeds were drilled out, and the emulsion tubes were modified to go ahead and run a different jetting system, so that way this thing didn't run overly rich. For some weird reason, even the guys from Performance uh, uh, Warehouse that were uh, doing these, uh, Hollies, because Hollies no longer Holly anymore. They are their own company, but they're owned by the Mr. Gasket Corporation and all the other companies that are incorporated with Performance. Uh, I think it's Performance Warehouse. I can't remember if it's Performance Warehouse or who it is. Uh, Performance Products is maybe what it was. But anyhow, they even kind of went over the specs and went, wait, why are we even producing this with some of these components in here? Um, so they kind of even did a head scratch there. So anyways, uh, we went ahead and retuned that, rejetted it, everything else to keep it from running rich. Uh, running a Summit Racing filter on it and a Mr. Gasket, uh, or I'm sorry, Moon Eyes. Moon Eyes, we put Moon Eyes in here. It used to be Mr. Gasket. Um, fuel gauges kind of keep it kind of classic looking. Um, you know, there's not too much to look at. I added a, a bus bar over here, just basic battery, um, nothing big, just uh, marine terminals on it. Uh, we're running a Champion radiator. I'm not big on the aluminum radiators, but when I do, I will run a Champion. Um, it's been a good radiator and everything. The one thing that we did add is we added one of these rad caps. These rad caps right here have a uh, sacrificial zinc anode that keeps all the aluminum in this motor from getting eaten up by electrolysis. If you're ever going to do anything that's an aluminum radiator, aluminum filler neck, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, the aluminum necks on these engines, or if you're going to do anything that's an aluminum water pump, anything that's touching the cooling system, I definitely suggest a sacrificial zinc anode. You're probably going to replace them once every about five or ten years, depending on how much you drive. Uh, we did have to add a vacuum booster onto this because of the camshaft. We didn't have a lot of vacuum built up, so we went ahead and put the vacuum booster on there. Uh, that also helps with the AC system, which is actually currently disconnected. Somebody put an aftermarket AC system in this, so we still have the hose there in case we ever decide to take it back, but we took all of that out. Uh, L&L headers, uh, L&L um, 
brackets for mounting the accessories, except for this one here is an original uh, uh, bracket for the uh, 460. Um, we have the AC compressor housing sitting here in case we wanted to ever, or I'm sorry, AC compressor bracket mounted here in case we ever wanted to put like an onboard air system or anything on this or go back to AC. I think this is going to be left alone because AC, putting AC back in this is going to be a pain. Uh, again, the redhead steering box down low. Um, so the pulley system here is all L and L except for for this uh, uh, 3G alternator. The 3G alternator actually is a power master, and we used to run the L and L uh, two groove pulley on there, but we kept on going through alternators. And so because we were going through alternators, we wound up talking with Power Master after a while and going, "Well, what's going on here?" And we come to find out that L and L does not cut these uh, pulleys that they provide in their kits for the alternator to work with Power Master. Each alternator kind of has a different uh, different kind of spec for how long that pulley needs to be on the back end to go ahead and put enough torque down uh, to to keep that alternator together. Um, so because of that, uh, Power Master had us send out the l, l pulley. They went ahead and I matched the spec on that pulley and made us our own pulleys. Uh, Robert wound up ordering three of those. We still have this one and the second one. I do not know what happened to the third. Um, could be in a desk drawer or something like that. So if you ever run into a problem with a Power Master and you're running it and you don't have, or and you have the L&L &L, uh, pulley system, you might want to call up Power Master, tell them what's going on, send them your pulley, um, and hopefully they can go ahead and cut you one. Um, it did not cost us hardly anything to do. Again, the MSD unit, we're running out the blue HVC coil on this. Uh, it runs fairly well. This is the same system as how I have set up in Chief Blackhawk, my, uh, my 1974 body 1979 pickup truck that I keep on quoting and I have not showed you yet. Um, we have the MSD 6AL back here. This is the digital unit. I mounted it back behind there because that's about the only place that does not have a bunch of heat in this engine compartment. Uh, heat and vibration is the number one killer for these. Um, so that's pretty much all to really show you under the hood, other than uh, things like uh, the L and L headers. We're running the shorties into a custom exhaust system. This is running a three chamber Flowmaster, and it does not have a nasty droning sound like you would normally think of from Flowmaster. Uh, it is a true dual setup. We don't have any H pipes or anything else like that. Um, I'll go ahead and close this up now, and we'll move into the interior. The interior of this was mostly done when we got to it. We had to go ahead and change out the uh, we had to go ahead and change out the carpet. So we went with an auto custom carpet and ordered one that had a, uh, a thicker pad underneath it. Um, we did leave the original uh, tank switch here. This was uh, listed as the gem tank. Uh, this one right here was actually out of, and I can tell you, uh, Clackamas. I can't even pronounce that. I can't even see half of it. Well, there you go. They're out of Oregon. This was actually the original manufacturer for these tanks. There were a couple of different tank kits that were made, but Gem Tank is actually the original. This switch does not work. Uh, we have this set up on the electrics. Uh, the way that we have the electrics set up is that you have the fuel switch here, and you can go ahead and switch on and off one of the tank switches to go ahead and switch between uh, either pulling from the dual tanks or the secondary. Um, all the rest of this is an electric fan, which you should hear fire up. I got dual fans on this thing. And then we have our ignition switch to go ahead and start, which I will not be doing. Um, we went ahead and we put a classic style look in, and it looks like she's dusty from just sitting. Uh, uh, RPM gauge. This is the Pro Comp from uh, um, Autometer. Really good gauge. Um, we left the gauges alone behind here, so it's running the black 100 mile per hour gauge. But we did use the enclosure, which is the black, uh, the black enclosure and pieces from a um, a Conoline van from the 1980s. I want to say that the one that we pulled for this one was an 82 or 83. Uh, they do fit. They have better plastic. They don't rot out. This one was rotting out. Uh, this was a new panel piece right here that was, uh, uh, I think actually that came out of the van. I take that back. I don't think this is a reproduction one. Um, this uh, enclosure here is the reproduction from uh, Dennis Carpenter. Really good reproduction for the radio and everything else like that. Um, I do have an intermittent wiper set in this. So, I mean, the wipers are good to go there. And you have all your intermittent here. I will be touching on that later. I did build that for Robert and Kimber because this is Kimber's truck being an automatic. Um, 
So, yeah, uh, we have the retro sound radio in here. I'd be firing her up right now, but I, I really don't. I have kind of a time constraint, so I probably won't be doing that. Uh, this is the retro sound model two. They come with knobs that you can purchase separately, this kit and this kit here, that are actually made out of billet aluminum. They look really similar to the originals. Um, they make one that's just full chrome or the black trimmed one. We kind of like the black trim because it kind of works with the 73, 74 kind of look. Um, the retro sound does have to be fitted. Um, I, it took me some time to fit that. I kind of took this whole assembly out and fitted it on the desk. I don't have that video anymore, sadly, but uh, it worked out really well. Um, again, we have the ARB uh, lockers. Oh, you know what? I take that back. I had lied to you earlier. This is actually running a front ARB locker. So you have the front air locker switch here, the rear air locker switch here. This is for the main compressor to turn on and off. Uh, those are two accessory switches, one of which is powering a USB hub and uh, power port over there. The other one is for extra lighting. Um, we have some decent back lights on this. Again, uh, all pro comp uh, gauges. Uh, we have uh, water, vacuum, uh, oil pressure, trans temp, and voltage. That way you can tell if you're charging. Uh, you can watch your water, and that is a mechanical gauge. The vacuum gauge will help you figure out uh, not only what your fuel mileage is, because the old fuel mileage gauges were actually cheating and doing a vacuum gauge, but it can also tell you what's wrong with your motor. So you already have something built in here that's almost like a code scanner in today's day. Um, oil pressure, for obvious reasons, trans temp, because when you're towing, you want to know how hot your trans is getting. Um, this truck, like I said, came with an aftermarket AC, which is kind of like that Ford one. It was listed as a Ford AC, but it wasn't produced by Ford. Um, this one here is actually one of the aftermarket covers. I think that does not have the Ford on it because the one that was originally in this was broken. So I went ahead and put that there so we'd fill in the hole and at least look decent, but that is an add on unit. And it actually had a sticker, uh, up here to go ahead and, uh, talk about which part was supposed to be for the AC, but all that's been removed and boxed up. Uh, Robert's ham radio up top. Um, that's actually been killing the battery. So another thing that I need to kind of touch on and fix. Uh, so I got to charge this puppy up. I have the battery disconnected at the moment. Um, this right here is the original headliner that somebody had put into this truck. We did not do this, but this is using like that toolbox material, uh, like you would be using on the bottom of your, like your Craftsman toolbox or anything to go ahead and grip your tools, almost like a tool mat. Uh, same with the seat. It's actually a really nice seat. Somebody did a very good job at reupholstering this. Um, it does not have any weird sags in it. It doesn't have any weird folds. Like it is, this is a beautiful attention to detail seat. Uh, this steering wheel came with the truck. We left it alone. Uh, funny enough, the horn button is actually out of my 1984 Ford Mustang from my Grant steering wheel. Uh, this is a Grant steering wheel and it does have some plastic pieces in it, but Robert liked the look of it. So we went ahead and left it and I don't think that'll ever be changed. Uh, again, I donated that to the cause. So it's kind of cool just to have the old 84s, uh, horn button in there. Sadly, that car got wrecked. That was my old anniversary edition. Uh, like I was saying with the steering, you kind of have like a little bit of a bump before you actually have any real steering or steering the wheel. This is actuating those valves down there on that steering unit where the hydraulic control is. So when you're pushing this way and putting resistance on there, you're opening and closing a valve for turning left, which will then compre or compress the ram and start pulling the ram towards the uh, steering box. And then when you're steering this way, you are expanding the ram. Actually, I take it back. It's the other way around. Is it not? Wait, left, right, left. No, I'm sorry. No, I'm correct. Left would be collapsing. Right would be expanding. Um, so that goes ahead and controls the hydraulic assist. A lot of people take that as a uh, bump steer. A lot of people don't like it because you're constantly steering like this down the road, but it's not that bad. Once you get used to it, you start getting used to it. It's almost like just driving around with loose steering. Um, again, this has the tank in the back. We put a uh, motorcycle's uh, uh, amplifier on the bottom to go ahead and amplify uh, the sound for this thing. Um, we do have the original shifter knob also on the 205 right here. So I didn't even have to repaint that one. Uh, these door panels are actually not original to this truck. Uh, this truck I do suspect was a custom trim truck uh, by what I've seen on it. And these are actually the door panels off of the Bronco. Um, we have one on the driver's side and passenger side. We kind of threw these in there just to put in there because we thought that we could go ahead and get another set. And it seems like they're getting harder to find. So eventually these will be going back in the Bronco. I'll get another reproduction set to go ahead and put on here. I just don't like them because they're a little thin. Um, for the ham radio, Robert put some speakers in here so that way you could listen to both channels for the ham radio. You do have a slider rear window that is tinted. It was very nicely done. Um, 
Other than that, uh, we put the head or the dome light mod to go ahead and make that clear so that way it's extra bright. Uh, I will go ahead and move on from here. At least everything closes. So these are those aftermarket tanks. They are actually running originally like almost like a lawnmower's cap. These are actually a cap that we pulled off uh, the number from Stant. These are actually the oil cap for an IDI truck, a 6.9 liter early 7.3. Actually, I take it back. I don't think the early 7.3 actually had those, if I recall correctly. I think the 6.9 was actually the only one that had this. I misquoted that. Uh, little magnet covers, nothing big. Uh, both side saddle tanks down low. Get a really good view of that drive line, which, I mean, I think has turned out fairly good. Um, this does have airbags in it. I need to put the extensions on here. I'll be doing that today while I'm here. Um, again, the wheels, uh, custom exhaust out either side, turned out very, very well. Uh, we run the pinnel hitch for the camper trailer. I'll go ahead and back up and show you the rest of the truck. I mean, she's a sharp looker and she sounds real good going down the road. I'll, uh, I'll try and do one of my old videos on that. This isn't going to be the best video in the world, so I apologize. The camera work isn't the best. I don't have my regular stabilizer with me. Uh, we put two rigid lights in the back, the same as what we have in the corner, except these are the surface-mounted ones. I went ahead and uh, centered and cut these. Originally, this bumper was not bent, but we wound up with a little jackknife situation on a trail that uh, Robert was driving on, and this got kind of dented up a little bit and pushed in, so I'll have to come back and fix that. The rear winch is hidden behind the license plate here and i did this the same way that they did uh that they had done the uh the worn bumper i apologize for the noise in the back we just had somebody pull up and so you have your winch back here and then you have your uh, little lighting circuit that you can unplug from the four pin connector to go ahead and run the led light that's on the license plate i'll just leave that sit there and then you have your control plug right here in this location that they would have in the worn bumper then obviously your seven pin connector back here. Um, that pretty much covers the majority of this. Um, the truck is pretty well, speaks for itself. She does pretty good. We never got this thing dyno. Don't have any horsepower numbers or anything else on her, but she's a good looking little truck. Uh, she's been a good truck even being six inches. Kimber kind of has to hop and skip into this thing. The Bronco might actually be easier for her to go into, but uh, yeah, she's a beautiful looker. Anyhow, uh, thank you for uh, sticking with me for 32 damn minutes. Um, if you've been watching this to this point, thank you, thank you, thank you. I really do appreciate it. Um, I'm sure most of you have not. Uh, go ahead and let me know in the comments section anything else you might want to see. Um, you know, I have quite a few projects of my own that I'll be touching on soon, and hopefully the, the videos will not be 32 minutes long. Um, so, but anyhow, this is the overview of the 1977 uh, Ford F-250 Highboy. Um, I figured you'd appreciate seeing this because this has always been kind of a show-getter truck. Um, Kimber will more than likely be keeping this. Um, this is kind of like her just kind of daily di driver truck for the moment. Uh, there's a couple things that need to be done on her, but she's okay. Um, anyways, uh, like, subscribe, comment, uh, subscriptions always help. Um, like I said, I'm trying to get some monetary uh, support from YouTube so that way I can go ahead and uh, put that money into that Bronco. And uh, if I can do that, that would be very much appreciated. I need a thousand subscribers for that. So thank you again. Um, I hope you all have a good day. And the next video that I'll go ahead and drop will be the one on the trail trailer, which I promise will not be 32 minutes long. Anyhow, uh, thank you again.